If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Acts, Acts chapter 13. Uh, while you're turning there, I'm going to encourage you always to remember me in prayer as your pastor and as we uh, try to uh, try to uh, talk to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Uh, that's why we were left here. Acts chapter 13, and we're going to begin uh, reading in the first verse. Acts 13, in the first verse, the Bible says, Now there were in the church which was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Mananin, which had been brought up with Herod the Terarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And, excuse me. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So when they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue, in the synagogues of the Jew. And they also, uh, ju, ju, and they all, and they had also John to their ministry. And when they were gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew who was named Bar Jesus, which was which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, for so he is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then, Paul, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, and set eyes on him, and said, O fool of subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, what wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we thank you for providing it to us as your people. God, we thank you that it's in our language that we can understand it and that it may be used to your glory and edification. Lord, we pray now that you would bless this word, that you'd be lifted up in what is preached, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, as to get started, and not so much in this church, and I've seen some pleasing things at many of our churches, but a lot of Baptists almost want to skip over Acts. And the reason why, number one, they don't understand it. And number two, they, they want to, they've drawn some things concerning the Holy Ghost that's simply not true. And hopefully we will see that today. And anything, it says all, all the word is good, uh, is good for us. Another book that a lot of uh, Baptists want to avoid is the book of James. Uh, some have even suggested it should have never even been in the King James Bible because it is all about works. And you know what? Here's the reality of it. It is all about works. And the reason a lot of people don't like it, it makes it very clear if you're not zealous unto good works, you probably don't have nothing anyway. And that's why a lot of people uh, don't like that book is because it emphasizes works. And that's okay. Uh, and works certainly have their place. They're not in redemption, but they certainly were to be the cause of redemption. And so we see in our text that Antioch is an unusual church in that it, is, it has some people in it that mean business with God. Now, a lot of people uh, say today, well, I wonder what's wrong with our churches. Well, I can tell you, and, and for 30 years, 20 years, I've heard, well, it's the last day. And, and people, uh, there were fewer than we used to be, and on and on and on it goes. But the reality is this, is we need men that, that mean business with God. You know, the Bible never tells us how large the church in Antioch is. 
Uh, ne never suggest that. We know that Paul went there, and apparently they had some good men there because uh, he felt he felt led to stay with them. I think about two years. But I want you to see the quality of the church. What set it aside is this. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets. Now, first of all, don't take that word out of context. It doesn't mean prophets like Elisha and Elijah. It, it, is, it is preachers. It's, it's really the same word, and it's, it's uh, uh, translated in different places in different ways, but it just means a preacher. And there were preachers in that church that meant business with God. You know, you know what's wrong with our churches today? They have pastors that want to uh, talk about theological long dissertations and what they have forgotten is prayer and simply just preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the problem in the modern day churches. And so we see that this church certainly sets itself apart even though we don't numerically know how large it was. They, they meant business with God. Now there were in the church which was at Antioch certain prophets, preachers, and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mananin, which had been brought up with, with, up with Herod the Terarch, and Saul. So how many do we have? Five men that meant, that meant business with God. Now, uh, uh, a lot of those are double-named people, so you really have to count it out. But all there was at the end of the day, there were five men that were willing to serve God and take whatever necessary risk there was involved to serve Him. Uh, and that set them apart at the church of Antioch. Uh, you ever wonder if there's anything that set, sets you apart from the others? Uh, it, ought to be, it ought to be something we desire. Uh, uh, I'm tired of the routine, aren't you? Uh, 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 I never knew where they came from until I was much older, but uh, when I was a boy, uh, there was a man that lived next to us, and I guess I should have put two and two together, but uh, I never thought about it, and, and he was a smoker, and he had cigarettes, and his cigarettes was just a white box, and it had cigarettes written in black across of it, just about as plain as you could get. What I found out later, they came from Fort Campbell. That's soldier cigarettes. And uh, that, that was years later. But you know, we ought to desire to be something more than that plain. But do we? Do, do we? do we want to be set apart? I believe we live in a day and age today where that desire is just about gone. And the end result is a very routine, lackadaisical, almost boring church time because they, uh, they, there are a whole group that doesn't do this. Verse 2, and uh, it says, as, as they ministered to the Lord. Now, I find that very unusual uh, wording because what were they doing? That, that would be my biggest question, wouldn't it, you, Brother Jared? What were they doing? And we'll see a little bit of it since they were fasting. Uh, what does minister mean? It, it, it isn't your preacher. Minister is doing something for the Lord. You know, when I have sick people, uh, you can minister to them, not necessarily share the gospel, but you're, you're providing things they need. You're, they're, they're the center of your attention. You're wanting to help them. And they minister to the Lord, and the Lord was at the right hand of the Father by this point. He wasn't there, but they ministered to who He was. And I believe we live in a day and age where that's also about a forgotten thing, that the Lord Jesus is some far away thing that we just think about and, and just discuss, but he is to be ministered to. As they ministered to the Lord, second thing, and fasted, the result, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, this simplistic, uh, first of all, uh, five men that, that meant business with God doing two 
very simple things, ministering unto the person of Christ and fasting, setting their flesh aside so that they could that, that they could put Jesus first. And while they're doing this, the Holy Ghost spoke. Now, this is my this is my full belief. We are not past the years of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because the Bible says, Jesus said, I think it's in John 14, Behold, I send ye a comforter. Mm -hmm. And that is the person of the Holy Ghost. He is still, uh, he's still our intervener. So I want to hear him talk, don't you? Mm -hmm. Now that ain't that flopping on the floor you see today and rolling around like a, like a worm in hot ashes. No, no, what, what, what it is is speaking to our hearts. I don't think this is necessarily just, you know, blown out of the pew and people, no, no. You know, uh, when the Lord convinced me to come to Dover, it was a very quiet time between me and the Lord. I knew the Lord wanted me to do something and I really already knew what he wanted me to do, but I couldn't understand. And the best thing when God's dealing with you is to know this, you will never understand the mind of God, just do it. Just do it, because you, you won't understand. Why would he want another church 10 miles from uh, a sound church at the time? Well, that was God's business, was it not? And so you, ha you have to be obedient. And, and the very same thing here, uh, they were just doing, they were just simply doing what God would have them to do, and God gave them the, pain, the plan. Verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed, again, fasting. Uh, you know, we don't do that as much as we should as New Testament Christians is setting this flesh aside, saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebuke this flesh for a few days so that I might, might attend to the things of God. Now, in the modern day, and listen, I, I believe in, in food fasting. I mean, that, that, that is a scriptural teaching. But what we need more than that many times is fasting from work because work just drives me nuts. I mean, it literally drives me nuts sometimes. Uh, I'm going to Michigan first week of April. You know what? I'm looking forward to it because I won't have to fool with work. You see what I'm saying? And, and so when these, when the Holy Ghost spake, it astounded them. It said that it was time to fast, time to do something. You know what? Uh, when, when the Lord says, calls a young man to preach, it ought to be the most exciting thing a church ever enjoys. Because they've been obedient, they've heard the call, and, and they've answered, and that's exactly, uh, <laughs> what the Lord did here. So after after they did this, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on him, on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Now I, I believe they were sent out by the church at Antioch, but they had the authority also of the Holy Ghost. You know why missionaries fail? It's because they're not directed by the Holy Ghost. They, they can't say, you can't sit back and say, you know what, I think probably down in Dixon County would be a good place to start a work. No, how did they get to this point? They fasted and prayed. They, they meant business with God, and God led them to the spot, not them themselves. And then they wonder when they get over there and they're going in the energy of the flesh and the direction of the flesh and they fall flat on their face. They wonder why they fell flat on their face. Well, that's why. No leadership. No, no, no movement of the Holy Ghost. Uh, no refreshing of the Holy Ghost. No, uh, no, no, uh, no direction there at all. Verse 4. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, that, and they had also John to their ministry. Now, I want you to see their ministry was very simple. They preached. Now, in the modern day, there's nothing wrong with helping people out that are going through a tough time. 
uh, Moe's and Fishes is a huge ministry, mostly based out of Montgomery County, and they come down here and they hand out food. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that, but that is not spreading the gospel. Is it alleviating a problem? Sure. Will it maybe make people pay attention to what you're saying? Maybe. But what I found, they're more there for the biscuit than the gospel. And, and that may be sad, but true. And, and, and so we see then that these individuals, they didn't go down there with a big plan or anything like that. They just preached the word. I, you know, I, where did they get that? How about the commission? Go into all nations, teach, preach, and teach. That's where they got it. And, and, and so we see they're very obedient to the Lord, and they're following the will of the Holy Ghost, and the Lord blesses from them for it. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they, came, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, I want you to see this interaction that's about to happen. Uh, Bar-Jesus was a sorcerer. He, he was a devil worshiper. He, he thought that, you know what? A lot of people are deceived too, and they think they're serving God and they're serving the devil. Mm -hmm. But it says, Bar Jesus was a false prophet. You think about all the, the, the people today that are meeting in the pews of so called Christian churches that blaspheme the very name of Jesus, saying he is inadequate. If I don't ask him, he can't save me. Well, you just want up God, right? That's an impossibility, is it not? He does the saving, not you. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that these missionaries had a very simplistic ministry and that was just preaching the word of God. Verse 7, which, meaning this bar Jesus, was with the deputy of the country, Servus Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and, and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, if you don't get anything else out of the message this morning, I want you to underscore and desire to hear the word of God. An infidel, a false prophet, desires to hear the word of God. That is not a, that is a spiritual, that is a spiritual awakening that the flesh simply does not have. You know, uh, you know what the flesh has when it comes to the, the word of God? You know, that, that's the only handicap of the phones. Back in the day, we could do like this, and no, nobody would hardly see you. You have to do like this. Like, you know, everybody in the house knows you're looking at the time, right? And so we see that this, this work had already started in Bar Jesus. It had already began. Uh, you know what the Bible says? Uh, he that beginneth a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And, and, and so this, this interest generated by the Lord is, uh, is not something that you can get away with or get away from, excuse me. Uh, verse 8, but Eliamus, the sorcerer, for, is so, for, it is, for it is his name so by interpretation, uh, another sorcerer comes on the scene, Eliamus. Uh, now, if I understand that text like it reads, I believe it's right, that was literally his name. His name, given name by his parents, the sorcerer. So the next time you think Larry Wayne is bad, at least mama didn't come up with sorcerer, right? It, it, it could be worse. But, you know, names were so important back then, I believe she saw something in this child that wasn't normal. She saw something in this child that was not good. And she called him what she saw. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so this individual, being by nature, and again, every one of us are like this at birth, being by nature against God in every way, he wants to intervene. But Elamus, but Elamus the sorcerer, so is his by name, by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, literally wanting to interfere with what the what Paul 
and <laughs> Barnabas were saved. Do you, do you ever see that in the modern day? People literally trying to interfere with spreading the gospel, undermining the character of the Lord's preachers, uh, doing what they can to hinder things as they go along. That's where we live today. And, and listen, it's not a new trick. It's not something that just began to occur. But even in the ministry of Paul, we see even then there were people doing it. Now, let me remind you, when, when God set forth to do a thing, it will be done. But we see that Paul is not, <laughs> not pleased with this man. Verse 9, then Paul said, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost and set his eye on him. Now, have you ever been opposed at preaching? Have you been ever opposed at the sharing of the gospel? If y'all want to go do East Tennessee, I say I'm going to do it when I, when I retire, finish my preaching every county in the state of Tennessee. I'll go over to East Tennessee and wind that up. Uh, you know what? People don't love the gospel. Now, by and large, I've been treated well. I got run out of the Walmart parking lot down here in Paris, and uh, uh, their, their property line was here, and I did like this, and I kept preaching. All right? But, I mean, she came out of there like a rat on a beacon, as mad as a wet hen. And that was the man, was female. And then she let me have it. You know, if he, we, we all need to experience that a few times. This is our safe zone. You're, you're not going to be rebuked in this place. Out there, you will be. Out there, where it's where the it is where the battle is, and and it will happen. And so, it should be no surprise to us that this man uh, uh, came to interfere with the gospel being spread to bar Jesus. And so, I want you to see what Paul said. In verse 10, it said, he's full of the Holy Ghost. He's right in line. He's running on full. He's in the will of God. And said, oh, full, oh, full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now, Paul did not beat around the bushes, did he? I think a lot of times we do too much of that. Uh, and then, being apostolic, you know what Paul did next? He placed blindness on that guy for a season. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he did go blind. Now, we can't make people blind. That's, the apostolic gifts are gone. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can stand up for the truth just like he did. So what set him apart? Was it just because he was Paul? I don't think so. Paul was made out of the same stuff I'm made out of, right? Maybe worse. <laughs> I've never held the coat to somebody being killed uh, while they want somebody kill somebody. You? And he still, I think the key is this. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was in the perfect will of God. And he had the strength to do it. Now, you think about your prayer life, your reading time, your worship time. Those are how you get full. Uh, just, the, just the other day, I came down here and about had a heart attack. I left here Wednesday night and had the old wife pick up with me because we brought some stuff for the church. And I went down here to what used to be Don's. And gas was three thirty a gallon for the cheapest stuff you could get. And I had 20 bucks on me, so I, I, I put it all in the tank, and it brought it up to between empty and a quarter for 20 bucks. And I thought, well, maybe at least I can get to the meal on this. And you know what? That's, it, it, it wasn't full. And that, that truck, the old one, the white one, I mean, it drinks gas. The one, and I don't know if I did him a favor or not, but the one I sold to Brother Jody, it's got a four barrel still on it. It gets like seven miles to the gallon. Hope for tips, young lady. And uh, uh, because, I mean, it will, it will just eat it up. 
and they'll eventually run out of gas if you let them. So, is there a one-time feeling of the Holy Ghost? I know what people mean like that. But I also know this. I've ran on empty before. You see what I'm saying? Do you think when I was saved as a 12-year-old boy and six years later, I had hair down to here and drank like a fish, that I was filled with the Holy Ghost? No, I was running on empty. You see what I'm saying? And I believe there's a lot of people, and you don't have to look like a punk to be running on empty. You can be sitting right here in this pew and be running on empty. And I believe that's what uh, we see today. And if you will follow the life of Paul, he was up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, uh, very quickly go with me to Acts chapter uh, still in 13, but drop down to verse 43. Acts 13 and verse 43. This missionary trip still continued, continuing. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and righteous proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now, this was a separate group. Some had been saved. They were teaching them. Paul and Silas was about to leave and, and, and go on and move their ministry elsewhere. And I want you to see what they encouraged them to do is to continue in the grace of God. Now, why do you suppose that is? Well, I, I, I would say this because the Jews and the works came right back in there. Remember the churches, the, the churches of Galatia, the Galatian letter was to numerous churches and all of them had pretty much gone for works for salvation. Very easy to happen. We, we stand amazed at the Campbellites today and, and, and Methodist people. No, no. Uh, that's happened for years. It's, it's happened since the church was organized. And so we, we, we see we shouldn't be taken by surprise of that, but yet and still, Paul reminding them as he leaves, it's a grace, it's a grace, it's a grace. And so as he's departing, uh, verse 44, and the next Sabbath, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So the, the work was moving, not just, not just the Jews and not just the Gentiles. Now everybody in the city wanted to hear the gospel. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against, the, against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee in light, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation in the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard, the, heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And the, Lord, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Now drop down to verse 52. And the disciples, that means just the regular believers, these Gentiles that had heard the gospel and were saved. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So I ask you this morning, how long has it been since you heard from the Lord? Now that word is precious and good and wonderful. But listen, I've heard it preached sometime where it becomes the living word of God to me. And it becomes precious in a new way. I've seen scriptures preached at the same time and get something new out of it every time. How does that occur? By the Holy Ghost. You know who one day will make you aware of your lost condition? The Holy Ghost. You know who, uh, if you belong unto Christ, who will set Him as the answer to all sin? The Holy Ghost. You know what? The Lord's churches need more than anything else in 2023 is a great stirring of the Holy Ghost. 
So we find two separate occasions. His, his sending out, and I want you to say both of these, he was opposing falsehood. Both of these situations, Paul was opposing falsehood, and the result was the Holy Ghost showed up. You ever opposed falsehood? Uh, I, I, and part of it was a joke, and part of it wasn't. Uh, years ago when I worked for the ambulance service, and it, it wasn't like it is now, we worked out of the back of the barber shop back then, and uh, we had a we had and we sat in the gazebo a lot. That was very critical of the gazebo. I've spent many long hours in that gazebo. And uh, uh, two people would always come by and see me. And I'm not going to say either of their names, but one of them was a Southern Baptist preacher. And, and one of them was ruler, ruler of the Russellites down here, the old kingdom hall. And they would come by and talk to me every day. And one of them was leaving. I'd make one of them mad, and the other would end up on his hands and leaving. And I won't say which one was which. And uh, uh, one of them was leaving one day and goes, oh, you'll never change. And I said, I hope not. <laughs> and uh, that is what we need. You know, we need that strength of the Holy Ghost. And you know what? I see it waning. Do you not? Listen, some of y'all, well, I won't say how many, some of you are older than me. Have you not seen it wane in 50 years? I've seen it wane in 35. I can't imagine adding another 20 years to that or, or even 20 years out to the future. What will it be then? You know what we need? We need some sincere men who seek the face of God. And I'll guarantee you, if you have that, the Holy Ghost will be faithful. The Holy Ghost will show up. And so we find the last place we're going to read it's a place many of us get into, and because of the nature of the flesh, few of us leave. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to be read, begin reading in verse 7, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, if you know the story of Timothy, he was a young preacher. Some suggest he was as, as young as 16 when he began to preach the gospel. Uh, he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Paul wrote one time, let no man despise thy youth. Uh, very, very same individual. And here we find, and we see, we see some insight up to where Paul was at. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 beginning in verse 7. Uh, excuse me. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 7. Now, if you know your Bible, you know previously uh, he gives Timothy some good, good encouragement to continue to hold the faith. Don't, not, do not to let it go. Uh, to continue to be strong and continue to hold what you know. In verse 7, leaving that encouragement, he says, I have fought a good fight. Nothing wrong with saying that. But it sounds like he's about to quit. I have fought a good fight. You know what? I'm 50, uh, I'm going on 55 years old now. I'm not going to say I have fought a good fight. I'm going to say I'm fighting a good fight. It's not behind me. It's still in front of me. I, I may have 20 good years left. Who knows? Yeah. And, and you know what? I need to main business with God for the 20 or the 10 or the 2 that I have left. Whatever it may be, I need to main business with God. And, and I believe, and, but you know what? Uh, I, I've been where, where Paul was right here, and I told the wife when I got home, I'm done, I'm through with it, I cannot do this anymore. Especially when we were at South Road. And you know what? He would not let me quit. He would not. You know what? When you're done is when you start pushing up daisies right over here. That's when you're done. And, and, and so he says, I have thought a good fight. Then he says, I have finished my course. Now, had he? 
I don't think you can say you finished your course till you're dead, do you? On the golf course, when are you finished? At hole 18, right? You can't say I finished the course on, on, on 16, can you? No. So how do you get in that mess? The way, the way the world is right now. Getting your mind off the person of Christ and lacking the Holy Ghost. Was Paul lost? No. Was he discouraged? You betcha. Was he ready to quit? You know it. Was he filled with the Holy Ghost? I think not. I believe he was running on fumes. I believe he was just about done. And we need to realize there's times in our lives that, listen, we do have difficulties. We do have problems. We do have periods where we're not as close to the Lord as others. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The faith means the oracles and truth handed down by God. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, I'm not going to get off that today, but underline crown of righteousness because not everybody's going to get it. Uh, there's four crowns in the New Testament. And Paul talks a lot about all of them. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. That's very simple, man. it? Just, just love and crave the appearing of God. The appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. You know what? The older I get, the more I believe I am more excited about the very coming day when he says, it's enough. Come up here. Oh, I look forward to it. Uh, throwing all this mess aside, never having to do one more thing whatsoever here on this side of eternity, but quietly at the feet of Jesus, praising him throughout the ceaseless ages. I cannot comprehend it, but I know that I want it. And Paul did too. Now, it's one thing to want it excitedly, but it's quite another to want it because you're sick. Sick, sick of working, sick of attending church, <clears throat> sick of preaching the gospel. You see, when I think about it, I'm pretty much running on full. That excites me. But I have thought about it as a way out. And then you're running on empty. That, that, then you're running on fumes. And I believe that's where Paul was. He, he wasn't necessarily thinking about glory to God. I'd rather be there than here. And there's quite the difference in uh, how you approach that. Do thy diligence to come unto, to shortly unto me. Very important when you're running on empty to get people who love the Lord around you. When you're discouraged, when you're ready to quit, when you're about done, get people that love the Lord near you and pray for you. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So again, they get to the root of the problem. Uh, Paul's alone. You ever felt alone? Now, I can't say that I've ever been alone, but I felt alone. And I know a lot of the prophets that have felt that way down through the years, have you not? Remember Elijah and his boo-hoo to the Lord? And he says, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed their foot, their, their knee to bow. Right. But we all get there, don't we? Sure. But Paul says here, uh, uh, listen, Demas is gone. He, he's loved the world so much, he left the straight-laced, boring church, right, to go out after the world and the mess they're offering. Demas have forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present evil world. So he was discouraged. And, and, and we all get to that point. We all wonder why people leave. We all wonder why things go the way. And when we do, if we're not very, very, very careful, we'll get to the point of quitting. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, into Crescens, to Galatia, Titus, unto Dalmatia, 
Now, I want you to see the, uh, the destination of this Demas, at least two of them. One to Thessalonica and the other destination of Galatia. What are in those two places? Churches. The church of our Lord at Thessalonica, the church of our Lord, to the churches of the Lord at Galatia. You know what, what he, you know what old Demas is going to do? Show them some fun. Show them a better way. Man, that may be discouraging. What, what is the one that the Lord called me to another church? And the next thing I hear from y'all, uh, uh, somebody come and say, you know what? They're having a youth program and they're down there and, and, and they had a rock band last week. And man, they, and they got so many people, they're, they're building on to the building. That, that, after 25 years, that would hit me in the gut, right? That, that, that's how Paul was feeling. He was discouraged. He was running on low. And he needed some help from the Lord. Now these other men were going to go on to him and they were going to help him. But what he needed was an encouragement, a booster from the Lord. And I believe that he gets it. <laughs> Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, to Crescens, to Galatia, Titus, unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Now, the average preacher that would come in here would say, man, you've got to be discouraged. No. Uh, I mean, this, this, this is like a mega church, right? I knew a church really well out in Washington State. Pastor Brother Larry Killian. Good, good brother in the Lord. When he died, you know how many people, t and they, they were sending out missionaries. And they did unbelievable Bible translation work. Three people, him, his wife, and one other man. Did they, did they let themselves get knocked down? No. But you know what? If Paul can get knocked down, if he can run out of gas, if he can run on, out on empty, you know what? You can too. The problem is, he's not sharing it with anybody and coveting the prayers of others. So he had glue. So he did have something. <laughs> There's what, 12 or 15 of us in here. What a blessing. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, if you want to look up John Mark in the Acts, mm -hmm. see, at one time, Paul had to let him go. Mm -hmm. He was hindrance. He was making the ministry even more difficult. But here we find, some years later, everything, uh, he says, bring Mark with you. He's going to be a blessing to me. Uh, and... Tychius have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Now I want you to see what he needed was some men of God to encourage him. Now I'm assuming the books was the Old Testament. <coughs> but you know what the parchments was? These little letters. Little letters he had wrote, and no doubt little letters that he had received back. And they were encouraging. They, they were glad. They were happy. Have you ever thought, and we get this routine, and we expect them, and we get mad if we don't get them? When we support a missionary, we don't get their monthly letter. We all get all flipped out about it, right? What kind of letter have you sent them? Right? Amen or away? Me and years ago, and I'm not saying this is Brad, but I'm just giving you an example. One time me and Donna and the kids sent a gift box for Thanksgiving down to Mexico for the crafts. Just some stuff we knew they liked. They, uh, they love pistachio pudding, which I don't know why, but that's their business, not mine, right? Uh, I like chocolate pudding. And, uh, uh, but we sent it. And at that point, I guess they had been on the mission field about 22 years. We were the first people that ever sent them a box of anything. 
pretty sad, isn't it? You see how Paul got discouraged? You see how Paul was about ready to quit? So we as the Lord's people, listen church, don't quit. Are you going to get discouraged? Are you going to, are you going to run on fumes? Listen, the best thing that I can tell you is just like Paul did. If you're running on fumes, get around the people of God. It sounded like to me that Paul was going to get into this. <laughs> he said, oh, especially the parchments, the New Testament, mm -hmm. the, new, the new word. Bring that to me when you come. And you know what? The best I understand, he probably got it. And he went on in the power of the Lord of the day that cut his head off. Uh, that, that's, that's where I want to be. What about you?